to all you guys for sticking around until today. Um, I am going to talk about one part of my PhD work on holarctic ground squirrels. And we've heard a lot of really good uh, evolutionary research this week, but I want to take us ecological just for a second. Long enough to quote uh, Hutchinson, who said that if we can have one or two species of a large family adapted to the rigors of Arctic existence, why can we not have more? And Hutchinson was considering the latitudinal diversity gradient and how patterns of resource availability uh, govern where species occur and don't occur. But I want to focus today on uh, those that are adapted to extreme environments like the Arctic. So I study squirrels, family Sayuridae. They're distributed here globally, and it's obvious from this range map of all squirrels that they inhabit a lot of uh, different areas and biomes on Earth. And my dissertation is actually focused kind of at multiple levels in this group, um, phylogeny and adaptation. Indeed, squirrels have evolved a range of ecomorphologies um, to better adapt to all these different biomes. Um, of course, they've remained sufficiently squirrely to be recognizable as squirrels, but uh, some ecomorphologies include uh, strictly terrestrial ground dwelling ones like these, arboreal taxa, and also kind of intermediate scansorial forms like these. Today I want to focus on what's arguably the most Arctic adapted of any squirrels, um, Polarctic ground squirrels, which is the genus Eurocetellus. What you're looking at here, I'm going to have a number of maps that are this projection. This is just a polar projection of the Northern Hemisphere, Asia, uh, North America, Beringia, the North Pole. We may have to change this in a few years to the extent of that. But, um, traditionally, Eurocetellus has been divided into two clades, a bigger clade and a smaller clade. The bigger clade is distributed holarctically. There's one species in Asia, one species that's holarctic, five species in green here that are distributed across Western North America, and five other species in the smaller clade uh, that are also distributed, a little more restricted in Western North America. I have to brag on this genus a little bit and say that it includes the Arctic ground squirrel, Eurocetellus perii, which is actually the northernmost squirrel species in the world. It occurs all the way up to the shores of the Arctic Ocean. It's the largest species in this genus, as you might expect. Um, it's been the subject of a lot of physiological research, in part because it hibernates seven to nine months of the year. It's an extreme hibernator. Uh, Brian Barnes has done a lot of this work, um, and he's shown that uh, they avoid freezing um, during hibernation, the body temperatures actually get down to below zero degrees Celsius. Broadly, uh, more broadly than that, adaptations to cold environments, high latitudes, high altitudes can include things such as changes in body size, change in morphological shapes, maybe due to changing food resources. Changes in hibernation behavior, which I want to highlight the hibernation, which I'm not going to talk about, but which is certainly an axis of adaptation in this genus. Uh, is a suite of adaptations and changes in phenology. So to investigate the exact ways that Eurocetellus is adapting to high latitudes, we attempted to resolve the phylogeny of this group. We also reconstructed ancestral ranges. Um, particularly what, what we want to address is the number and sequence of Arctic and Old World colonizations in this group. For instance, has this happened more than once? And last, we wanted to test for possible morphological adaptations to high latitude. So uh, more specifically, we use multi-locus methods. We have four loci uh, represented by all of your Sotellus, one mitochondrial and three nuclear loci. We use species tree methods implemented in Starbeast. Um, for ancestral range reconstructions, we use Bay Area, uh, written by Michael Landis. And this is a Bayesian program that allows inference of ancestral ranges over many geographic areas. We did this over a range of distance priors, and beta is the distance prior here. Uh, it's basically our knowledge or belief or estimation of how freely ancestral taxa can move around. So basically a higher value of beta means that uh, taxa can move around spatially a little bit faster or more broadly. Yeah. So. And we also conducted some morphological analyses to get at why and how these squirrels are doing this. Um, we analyzed specifically body size from uh, about 566 animals. 
We look specifically at the association of body length with mean annual temperature. And we also looked at cranial shape and a subset of these uh, specimens. Uh, we quantified cranial shape using 2D Cartesian coordinates, 24 uh, landmarks on the ventral surface of crania, and did this and analyzed the data with these software packages. So on to results. This is the maximum clade credibility species tree of Eurocytalis. All the species are represented. Uh, you can see that there's strong support, and just to, get, to remind you about the, the uh, diversity in this group, the, an orange on the range map and then throughout uh, is a small air clade. Uh, the rest of these are in the big air clade. Again, purple or pink, depending on how you see that. It's undulatus, the pale arctic, strictly pale arctic spe species. Harii is the arctic ground squirrel, which is full arctic. Um, and you can see there's strong support for this small air clade, as traditionally recognized. There's strong support for a group that includes the arctic ground squirrel and its close relatives. Uh, there's weaker support here, uh, and we're trying to resolve this with more low side now. And um, I think this may be due to just a long branch here, maybe, when Undulatus colonized the Pale Arctic and kind of is isolated there. This may be a long branch, maybe hard to resolve. I do want to note, though, that, um, as I said, we're trying to get at the number of Arctic colonization events. And there's some gene tree discordance, as you can see here. But um, you can see that in only one tree is Undulatus sister to a group that includes Perii, immediately sister. So in all these other clades, these are separated. They're not uh, very close relatives. We proceeded with the species tree I showed you for these further analyses, despite some uh, statistical, statistically low support. But again, I just want to remind you, this is the range map of Eurocytelis. The bigger clade in purple, blue, and green, and the smaller clade in orange. So to do these ancestral range reconstructions, we use data from the Nature Conservancy, basically of biogeographic realms. These are vegetational biogeographic realms. Uh, for instance, this really light blue is tundra, taiga, so forth. We clipped these to the, include the range of all Eurocytelis, and this resulted in 16 discrete biogeographic realms within the range of Eurocytelis. And I just want to add that this method allows us to have some inference of ecology instead of strictly spatial analysis. So we can incorporate both spatial information and ecological information where these species occur. And we coded um, species for presence or absence in these 16 realms. And this resulted in a matrix something like this, where Undulatus is represented in all the Pale Arctic regions. Area is represented in some mixture, so on and so forth. <laughs> I mentioned that we inferred ancestral ranges over a range of distance prior to beta. Um, and this is the range of prior values we uh, used. And it's actually quite a wide range. You can see there's really strong support for a distance prior around 1.8 or 1.9 in this group. Um, and again, beta is our knowledge of how or it's our belief of how really ancestral taxa are moving around among areas. This figure shows ancestral range reconstructions for yours to tell us, uh, summarized as pie charts on the nodes. And I've color coded all the biogeographic realms here. Um, and actually, these are only the Arctic realms. And so I've collapsed all the Pale Arctic realms, some of which, some of these are replicated in the Pale Arctic, like tundra, taiga, but I've collapsed all the Pale Arctic realms, just took down the black for the visualization. Um, you can see across the tree, there's pretty strong support in a lot of groups for um, ancestral ranges, either in temperate conifer or desert scrubland biomes. I do want to sh um, point out that Undulatus, the Pale Arctic species, there's strong support for that, for the ancestral taxon having occurred in the Arctic, particularly in Tiburt Conifer uh, biome. And also in Peria, there's strong support for having, for the ancestor having occurred in that same biome, but also some support for uh, Tiburt grassland and taiga origins as well. We view this as really strong support that there have been multiple colonizations of the Arctic from a Neartic Tiburt ancestor. How are these animals doing this? 
how they're adapting multiple times, probably, to the Arctic. Uh, we looked at, as I said, the association of body size with latitude, um, excuse me, not latitude, mean annual temperature. This is a graph that plots the log of body length against decreasing mean annual temperature. You can see that there's a significant relationship. And again, just kind of to visualize, these are on this end of the plot are small, uh, small eared species distributed in and around the Great Basin, and large species like the Arctic ground squirrel distributed far north. <clears throat> As I said, we quantified cranial shape using geometric morphometric data. Uh, we performed a discriminant function analysis, and um, the first three axes of this analysis actually separate out most taxa really nicely. The first three discriminant functions explain about 70 per six, actually exactly 70 per cent, six percent of the variation. We wanted to uh, kind of, given that there's a range of body size variability here, um, analyze the effect of that size on shape. So basically, elometry. We performed a multiple regression of each of these axes on size, and you can see that the first six axes are all significantly correlated with body size. All right, so this, this says there's a strong allometric effect on, of, cranial, of size on cranial shape in this group. This is the same data kind of visualized a different way. These are basically allometric scores of all the specimens um, plotted against centroid size of the specimen, and you can see that much of the variation is explained by centroid size. And so what this says is that across a range of habitats and latitudes and temperature, mean annual temperatures, um, that there's not much difference in skull shape. I mean, these animals are do, able to do a lot and adapt to a lot of conditions with some basic body plan, cranial plan at least. And we'll zoom way out. This is my last slide. And uh, show a figure from a paper that came out last year, and this is an analysis of mandible shape. So these are mandible shapes um, across all squirrels. So kind of think back to that range map I showed you first of all squirrels distributed globally. And again, shape plotted versus size, and there is an allometric effect here, right? This, there's a linearity here. Uh, there's a lot of scatter though, so these regression lines don't explain a lot of variation. And this is saying that at, at the widest level, at the broadest level, there is allometry. That is a factor. There's also a lot of eco-morphology happening here, right? So there's a lot of scatter around this allometric regression. Uh, so this brings up the issue of scale, right? Um, across all squirrels, across a very large taxon distributed widely, there's eco-morphological signal. Within the genus Ursatellus that I looked at here, um, they're able to do a lot with the same basic cranial plan. And so adaptation, in some sense, in a widely distributed group like this is a question of scale. So thanks, I'll thank these people and take any questions.